Now, I want to unpack this story, and I want to unpack it by telling you another riddle. <laughs> uh, this is a, a riddle that was uh, written by uh, Simone Weil. She said, uh, what does a miser lose when he loses his fortune? Right? This is a question I think is in gravity and grace. What does a miser lose when he loses his fortune? And what she's referring to is a famous fable by Aesop about this miser who has treasure that is buried at the bottom of his garden under a tree. And every week, every Sunday, this miser would go dig up the treasure, count it, and then put it back. Right? And he would do this every week, never spent it, just counted the money, then went back to his house. Anyway, a thief sees this one day and so under cover of darkness, the thief comes and steals the treasure. Next Sunday comes along, and the miser goes to the tree to uncover the treasure, but there's just an empty hole, and he screams out. And some neighbors hear, and they come over to him, and they say, what's wrong? And he says, well, I've buried some treasure here, and every week I come down and I count it. But now it's gone, some thief has stolen it. And one of the neighbors says, well, did you ever spend the money? Did you ever use it? And the miser was like, oh, no, 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 I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. And so the neighbor just picks up some stones, throws it in the hole, and says, well, count those. It'll do you as much good, right? <laughs> it's a nice little fable. So what, what's going on here? What does the miser lose? Because, of course, he loses his fortune. He loses the money. But there's something else going on because his response is much more extreme than the situation requires. If he's never going to spend the money, why would he be upset, right? Why, why you know, this, you're not going to spend the money, you're never going to use it. So, hey, someone stole something that you never really had. But yet he is upset. So Lacan, a French uh, psychotherapist, philosopher, he, uh, he said, well, here's what the miser loses. The miser loses a sacred object that protects him from looking at the difficulties of his life. So, which is a, a fetish object. A fetish object is an object that you have. You don't think it's magical, but you treat it as if it is. As long as you have it, uh, it kind of magically protects you from looking at other difficult situations in your, in your life. So for example, I know a family and tragically they lost their, their son in an accident. And they kept the room exactly as it was when he was alive. And the father, who is a very, you know, a dignified, quiet man, you know, found it very hard to show his emotions. Very hard to do it. So he was a very quiet, just quietly dying inside. And years later, when they finally started to take the room apart, then the emotions came out. What happened is by keeping the room that way, that was a way to protect against the huge tsunami of emotion that would have killed him, right? The fetish object was an object that was doing something useful, which was protecting the person from en encountering all of this suffering and pain. But of course, eventually, you have to pick away at it and allow those emotions to be felt allow them to come to the surface, right? So the idea of the miser is they're living in this kind of squalid condition, but as long as they've got their money, they don't have to experience the trauma of that. Just like a security blanket, the child has a security blanket so that they can not experience the trauma of like, you know, being in a room full of people. Now, interestingly, there's nothing wrong with this. We do it for a reason because life is difficult. I know someone who, uh, they, they went through a very, very difficult time in their lives, and they were in a relationship, and it was kind of in and out of this relationship. It was a difficult relationship, but that was the one thing in their life that they thought was the answer. As long as they had that relationship, they could, they could not look at everything else that was going on in their lives. They, they didn't like their work. They didn't like where they lived. They didn't like themselves, all of this chaos, but as long as they had that, and it wasn't a healthy thing, and so whenever it broke, they realized, oh my goodness, I've got so much work to do. There's so many things. And I was, I was using that to avoid confronting all of these difficulties. Now, Paul Tillich, 